everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, When Interns Know More Than CEOs, Four Strategic Paths in the Transformation. I would now like to introduce Joseph Oman, PhD, MBA. He is an associate professor, professor at the Technical University of Denmark. His research interests focus on managing large-scale systems engineering programs. He is the founder and coordinator of the Engineering Systems Risk Lab at DTU. Prior to DTU, Joseph worked at MIT and ETH Zurich, where he also obtained his PhD. He's won numerous awards and scholarships, including regular keynote speakers, invitations, and teaching awards. I would now like to turn it over to Joseph. Thank you, Lucy, for the very kind introduction. Hello and welcome, everybody. Very excited to be here, and thanks for joining us today. I'd like to quickly acknowledge the great Brightline team who made this possible. That's uh, Yafnika, Sergio, Emil, and uh, Janine behind the scenes. <clears throat> um, and I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the folks that did all the hard work that I'll be presenting today. Um, Diana, Evan, Joanna, Lena, Morton, and Pella. If you download any of the additional material that I'll be showing you uh, at the end of this presentation, then you'll, you'll find their names uh, there as well. So today we're going to talk about, spend sort of 20, 30 minutes now talking about some of the highlights of uh, work that we've done with about 40 senior executives uh, over the last um, last year. <clears throat> and um, the, the question here um, really was how do um, senior executives, when they work in their, um, in their strategy processes, deal with, uh, with risks and uncertainties. And um, <clears throat> we'd like to think of our CEOs, uh, CFOs, and folks in the strategy department as people that know a lot, and they certainly do. And we'd also like to think that if we only predict the world well enough and then plan well enough, as well as stick to our plans well enough, then everything's going to turn out just fine. Now, uh, we could have a great discussion now about how, how often that happens. So that's a bit of the premises that we uh, started this, this research with. I, I brought you a little quote here from uh, a very smart, very intelligent, very influential person that uh, I had the joy of listening to about uh, two, two years ago. And of course, uh, the audience had a bit of a chuckle here. He was convinced it's uh, three billion. And I just thought, ah, oh, you know, I learned in school it's five billion. And when I was putting these slides together, I was like, yeah, okay, now it's six billion. Now you can all write down what you think uh, the right answer here is. With my six billion, I was wrong by just 1.7 billion. So, and it's kind of a, a thing that we should all know and agree on how many people there are on the planet. And now just imagine how much harder this gets as we deal with. Um, strategy in the age of digital transformation where things happen just you know a lot faster um, than this so um, tying back to what i said earlier we'd like to think of us when we do strategy work as uh, you know having all the best information available putting our plan together um, executing it but what's um, what, what can we do to for the gap that we you know notice in our work a lot that a good plan is necessary but not sufficient so how do we move from this predicting and planning to a monitoring and reacting and how can we reconcile these two so we asked our senior executives um, one very simple question how do you deal with uncertainty and how do you deal with risk in your strategy work and um, we started with this very simple question. And then we usually had a chat for an hour, sometimes two, three hours. And um, two surprises came out of that, other than the results I'm going to show you uh, in a second. The first one was that we actually did not ask about the digital transformation of their businesses, but that is literally what practically everybody talked to us about. That is a topic that came up that... Uh, was you know on top of their minds and at top of their thinking about the strategy work that they were, were facing at that uh, at that time and i still think uh, they are and then they because the senior people they of course didn't just answer our question but also talked about other things that felt important and uh, rightfully so the one additional item they brought up and added to the mix were people um, and that was a very very 
uh, good thing to do. So digital transformation, you know, I was, um, I guess many of us on the call here have kids and uh, some of you may have uh, teenagers. And I've started listening to a blog uh, or a, a podcast called uh, Reply All, yeah, to keep on top of uh, development in the digital world. Because yes, I've heard about blockchain and artificial intelligence and big data. I learned about TikTok as I was preparing for this talk. Apparently that's a big thing. You do videos on there. So I don't quite understand how it's different from YouTube, but people tell me it is. And then there's a whole lot of other apps, which apparently are amongst the most popular apps with uh, um, teenagers uh, today. So, and that, I, that actually gave me a little bit of pause. And I, I was a little bit more sympathetic uh, towards uh, our executives that uh, may have struggled with artificial intelligence, where I think, you know, how I can it be, you know, okay. go get a lecture at one of the technical universities, uh, visit a seminar, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, learn about that a bit more. But things are happening so fast, you know, so that, uh, that that's what makes it interesting. And I think that's why it came up as a topic when we ask, well, how do we deal with risk and uncertainty? Because um, um, that's, that's where we are right now. And uh, YouTube uh, has reached this goal in 2017 of serving us more than 1 billion hours per day uh, of uh, content. So everybody on this planet, you know, we can just have that number. Uh, uh, watches about eight minutes. So that is a playlist that's uh, over 100,000 years long. So a lot of things are happening here. So lots of business opportunities, lots of innovation happening, but also one big question of, you know, how do we leverage that for business? Or, you know, how do we, how are we conscious uh, of that and what the impact may be? So here's what they told us, or I should be more precise, here's what we made out of the many, many things uh, that they've told us. We walked away from these sort of 40 discussions um, and basically yeah, started sorting all the different practices that we've heard about into these four uh, categories that you see here, discover, experiment, transform, and uh, excel. And that is what we'll be walking through now uh, in the next couple of minutes. The two axes that you see there at the bottom is the degree of uncertainty. So here's our, the risk and uncertainty that we started asking about. And the second axis that you see is the degree of people impact. That is what the executives added as uh, we were talking to them. So I love risk management. I love talking about uncertainty. So I, we could easily spend an hour on this slide. Um, we won't, but I'd like to quickly highlight, because we're going to come back to this, the three major categories of uncertainty that we uh, heard our executives talk about. So wh where does the uncertainty come from? Where do the risks uh, come from? We're not talking about how they impact us. So that is on the cost side, on our, uh, let's say on the safety side, on schedule side, but where, where does the uncertainty originate? And those are three categories. The first, not surprisingly, is technology. So they just gave us all these examples of digital transformation. So what's going on there? What is some of the underlying technical developments? What are some of the apps and products uh, that are out there? What can it do? How mature is it? What can it do two, three, five, ten years from now? The second category was uncertainty around the market, uh, or more specifically, the market needs. What is it that our customers want? Um, what is their uh, willingness to pay for certain new services? How do we figure that out? <clears throat> and the third category, a sort of uh, source of uncertainty, were the internal capabilities. What kind of qualification profile do we need in our organization? What qualification profile do we have? Well, it's not necessarily a trivial uh, question to answer. And then, of course, how, how do we get from one uh, to the other? The second I mentioned, I'm only going to mention the uh, talk about that briefly is the degree of people impact. So here it's basically two major things, how many people are impacted by our uh, strategic initiative that we're discussing here and how afraid are they? Uh, very practically, they, they hear about us starting something new. Just how much does that scare them? And uh, we all know that our feeling of scaredness isn't necessarily related to 
facts uh, or you know, but it, it, it also has very very much to do with let's say the amount of trust that's in an organization and so a very very interesting uh, conversation you know that we could have here as well but let's keep it at that now so our two dimensions uh, that we're going to walk through now we're going to start on the discovery side of things so this is where we talk about strategy initiatives that have the potential to scare people and where we have a lot of uncertainty. So here is basically what we're trying on initiatives that the executives talked about where they turned unknown unknowns at least into known unknowns. And uh, it's scary because you know we're reading in The Economist that now white collar jobs are all gonna be automated away, away by AI. It's not just the blue collar uh, folks were in production, always happy to explain to people how this is creative destruction and they're going to find a new job and it's all going to be great, but now it's about our own jobs and um, that is of course very, very scary. And so if you run a consultancy and then you announce, all right, now we're going to investigate and invest heavily into AI and figure out what that's about because we'd like to automate your job away. You don't say that, but that's what people think. That is of course uh, a scary thing to hear. Plus. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here. We just talked about technology, market, and um, uh, capabilities. Um, so, um, where we see a lot of this happening right now, right now, I mentioned consultants. It's actually um, talked to these people quite a bit, but uh, in the manufacturing industry, so everything around industry 4.0, um, you know, Internet of Things. And how do we leverage that? So interesting question here is now what did, you know, how do we deal with that um, uh, as, uh, as organizations? And we saw a couple of interesting examples here. One and, um, is uh, something that we're doing very well here in Denmark is an example of an industry association called MATE, Manufacturing Academy of Denmark. We bring a couple of hundred manufacturing companies together and in Denmark that is you know a good chunk of them and we just pull our resources and uh, we say okay let's find out together what all this digitalization is about let's you know figure out what people are doing internationally let's have seminars for the executive level let's showcase you know some of the uh, successes uh, we've had so we share best practices we bring in external speakers we just provide this uh, food for thought we came across a company that does this discovery very well and actually manages to sell it as a service, and that is um, IBM. Uh, they uh, have their Watson uh, Internet of Things tower in Munich, and maybe you've been there. It's, um, it's an experience, and I'm sure other companies do it uh, equally, equally well. But they say, hey, our job as a technology developer and somebody who um, brings us into the market is also help other companies discover about it. just learn about the opportunities that are out there and get the uh, conversations um, going so the big takeaway here important message is that discovery is also strategy work and we were always joking in the team saying well 90 percent of it happens on the golf course and that is probably true and it's a nice way uh, of doing it but um, we've also worked with companies to set up you know, innovation offices and staff functions that do just that. You know, do the road mapping, bring in the external experts and uh, just help the company understand where, where the trends are going. Now, I've arm twisted our Brightline team into trying to make this a little bit interactive. So I'd like to know from you how you do discovery and uh, you now can use the question function to send your answer. So you have to send your answer as a question. That is the, uh, the, the tricky bit here. So what do you, um, what are some of the activities, some of the processes that you run in your companies as part of the strategy work to just discover the new trends and, and learn about the things that you don't know in the area of sort of technology uncertainty, uh, market uncertainty, uh, as well as your internal capabilities. While you do that, um, sort of my perspective here on the discovery work, if I look at all the things that we've seen is one of the key enablers or the key best practice is sort of staying focused on the value question, sort of ask why, why do we care about this and ask it nicely. Don't ask, you know, why should I care about blockchain? Uh, we've had a successful business for the last 80 years. Uh, I, I don't need this now. No, it's like, all right, that sounds interesting. So how, how could that possibly impact our, um, uh, our business? Amazon does that very nicely. You know, they start working on the press release from the day they have an idea. The press release becomes this 
document that they work on where they articulate from a customer's point of view how this new technology, this new service that they thought of uh, can, uh, can help them. Uh, I think the outside-in processes are uh, important here for the discovery work. Um, it is surprising that these things happen or we don't know about them because they happen outside of our company and maybe also outside of our supply chain. So how can we um, bring that outside in view, uh, view uh, into the company? And I gave the example of this industry association that we're running here that is very, very successful in doing that. And uh, you know, last but not least, discovery is also about understanding and articulating what we do not know yet. That is the whole point. The point is then not to be scared, but to be able to work on that in a structured way. And now I'm gonna see if the questioning uh, worked. So I should, Emil, I don't see anything yet. So maybe it didn't work. Maybe, let me see here. Oh, no, I see it. Yes, trend analytics. Yeah, maybe you can probably also read these questions together. Yeah, that's a nice uh, sort of structured method. So if you are in a, a position to run a, um, a staff function or do technology management, I think uh, that's, a, that's a great way of doing it. Uh, Ayman is sending in the play golf answer. Yeah, connections and networking. That is that is how a lot of it happens. And I think it can also be done in a, in a good and thoughtful way. <clears throat> and we also have yeah, the, uh, that we sort of look at disruptions and leverage disruptions that are happening, uh, realignment of knowledge and skills for the future. I think that's where we'll end up. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I think observing other disruptions can also be a good uh, way for us, helping us in our discovery. All right. So that worked well, let's, uh, let's keep on doing that. Now, uh, moving on to the second category here. Now we are going from discovery to uh, experimentation. And um, uh, and um, yes, so we can call it experimenting, we can call it prototyping or piloting. I think what's interesting here is just to realize that this is also strategy work. Yeah? So, and um, we sometimes when we in the read about the strategy process, we feel like, okay, we, we design it and then we're done with the design and then we go and implement it and we just execute the plan, what I've talked about earlier. But I think it's very, very important to realize that experimenting and prototyping, figuring out what works and what doesn't work and closing these gaps in knowledge is also, uh, important part of strategy work and strategically um, relevant. We had a very interesting story happening here uh, with one of our, uh, one of the companies that we talked to uh, in the construction sector. They were investing heavily in artificial reality, virtual reality, building information management systems, which is all the good things that you're supposed to do these days when you're in construction, so you're embracing uh, the new technology trends, they invested in that for 10 years. So they had the technology figured out. They had the internal capabilities figured out. And after doing that for 10 years, they closed it all down. Why did they close it down? It was a great solution. It worked well. Had to close it down because no one in the market was willing to pay for it. They said, this is great. Thank you very much. We're very happy to take this for free. And then as a business, you say, no, 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 no. I'd like to be paid for it, but the customers uh, weren't there yet. A similar story that happened in Germany many years ago with uh, uh, Trumpf, they do um, sort of machine tools. They had one of the first and most powerful 3D printers. And it's only recently that that level of quality has been reached again. Yeah? Theirs was a little bit expensive, but they got it figured out. Again, a situation, nobody bought it. Yeah? Why? Not because they didn't want it, but people simply did not know how to use a 3D printer. Yeah? They were, no engineer had learned how to you know, develop the models and code for the machine. Nobody understood what the things are that you could do with 3D printing that you can't do with normal uh, manufacturing uh, techniques. So it was just sort of a expensive toy that did things that you could do some other way, just slower and in a more expensive way. So we love focusing on the technology as a critical uncertainty and we love for a uh, lesser degree um, also on the uh, figuring out what we can do and not to. But the point I'm making here is that as we do experiment and prototype, it's just as important to also experiment and prototype with the market 
acceptance uh, of um, uh, of what you're doing. <clears throat> we um, and we saw a couple of good examples um, uh, around that. Yeah, we can we can think about sort of a lean startup philosophy. So what's the fastest way that we can fail here what is the hardest thing that we can work on and that is that is very very important here in the experimenting phase that we don't do the easiest thing first but we actually try and figure out what is the hardest technology challenge what's the hardest in terms of capabilities that we need to get on board and what's also the biggest thing that we don't know about um, the market an interesting discussion we had here and uh, that you'll probably also know from your organizations is when do we move into experimenting? Because when we start experimenting, we actually do start spending money. And yes, we can uh, have a phase model here that we don't start spending a whole lot at the beginning. And uh, we saw a couple of good stories around that as well. So one of the rules was that uh, you want to may have a good business story. So you, you want to be able to articulate in your discovery phase why your customer cares about it. You want to have somebody passionate about it in your organization. And third, you want to have enough money in the bank or it's supposed to be cheap enough that when it turns into nothing, you don't go bankrupt. And you know, ideally, you also don't lose your job uh, over that. The big question here with experimenting and uh, that also came up is, how do we do that practically in our organization? Do we do that in our established organization that is very good at doing what we've always been doing? Or do we need to create a parallel organization to give folks the freedom to try out sort of new ideas, new, new processes? And there are good arguments for both. Uh, what's probably true is that you know, most, some people are very happy in the current setup and that is their strength and we're making good money with that. And it, it's not always the best idea to try and force them into sort of the, the new fanciful experimentation. That's why we said earlier, if we need to, we need to have folks that are passionate about this, and then we can uh, we can actually run this. So let's hear it again from you. How do you do? How do you guys organize experimentation, particularly if it's sort of strategically relevant uh, topics? So or how do you go about saying, hey, we're interested in this, and here are the things that we don't know, and here's what we're going to learn about it and, uh, and uh, organize the way that we spend money on it. While you do that, so my um, key takeaways here, and we've covered some of those, is the value of experimentation is that you, know, you learn to focus on the most critical uncertainties. If that is technology, fine, invest in that. But we have seen plenty of examples where actually the market that was the hardest. So um, focusing on that during the experimenting actually makes the most sense. Fail early, fail fast, fail cheap. Yeah? So the, the lean startup mantra that can also be used here and create an organization where it's okay to fail early, fail fast, and fail cheap. Uh, road mapping is also something that we saw here where we said, okay, here's the steps that we need to take. Here's what we don't know yet. And ideally, in your roadmap, include the customer somewhere. Huh? At some point, we'd like somebody to pay for this. And it's okay to also look at that willingness to pay uh, rather early. And then, also importantly, you want to limit the worst case scenario. If you're a startup, you can't. You just put all your eggs in one basket and you go for it. But if you're an established company, you want to be a little bit thoughtful about how much money can we lose on this worst case. And then um, use that also as a filter to evaluate the options uh, that you have moving forward. Okay, let's see. Uh, we have conceptual systems modeling and simulation, yes. I like that very much because we like to tell people that they should do more of that. So um, we could add to that uh, virtual prototyping. And um, if we if if we have a model of our system and uh, we can, can model the important variables, that's a great, great way uh, to go. But I would argue we'd probably cover mostly the, the technical side uh, with this. All right, I'm reading through this yes and here is a i like that identifying key themes throwing ourselves with the pilot work um, making it fast and cheap enough um, so that we can uh, work step by step and failure will drive us elsewhere i think that's also a nice way of putting it now that failure is great as long as you learn something from it and if it helps you inform your uh, decisions seeking partners i like that one because uh, uh, that makes financial sense. Uh, it also makes a lot of content sense because they may be better at figuring some of this out than you do. Start in identifying when to pull the plug early on. Yeah, um, 
good one, also a tricky one, because there are basically two failure modes here. We pull the plug too early or we pull the plug too late. So, but that is one of the big themes here during experimentation of how do we get this pulling the plug moment uh, just right. And uh, also a very dynamic one, keep it open, involve more, more people from our organization. Well, that sounds great. And I have a lot of respect for you if you can sort of manage that process that's probably semi-chaotic, but maybe it's uh, it's supposed to be uh, like that. Understanding the culture of your target audience, yes, mm, I like that. And uh, if you if you can do that well, then you can maybe you know you maybe even have an inkling of what they want uh, before they know uh, that themselves. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that. It's working very well here. So. Next uh, next theme, now we're moving over to transformation. So now we're talking about a set of practices where we've decided, okay, this is worth the effort. You can see on the axis at the bottom, uh, this is now relatively low uncertainty. I'm not saying it's easy to do transformation. I'm, it's hard, it's maybe the hardest out of the four here to get right, but there shouldn't be a lot of uncertainty left when you start with a company-wide or market-wide or sector-wide or, or product range-wide transformation. Uh, process. You should know, be fairly sure about the market, fairly sure about that the technology works, and fairly sure that you have your ducks in a row in terms of capability to start this and where to, um, uh, what direction to uh, grow the organ uh, organization. Now, what became clear to us is that a lot of executives were excited when they talked about discovery and experimentation. And a lot of executives were excited when they started talking about transforming the organization, getting the people on board, creating this ecosystem that just keeps adding energy to it, and then ex you know, getting the, the, the motivation because people just bought in on how to, how to do this, how to run it. What's interesting is we had people that were excited about both, uh, or people that were excited about discovery, and then we had people excited about transformation. But there were very, very few people that were excited about doing both. Um, and uh, I would argue maybe there aren't a whole lot of people that are actually good at doing both kinds of activities. And this is in a way a classic argument that we're making here between exploration and exploitation. That's how the academics call it. Exploitation means you just keep doing what you're doing and you just keep doing it better and better and better and you just keep growing and growing and growing because you're making money. So keep doing that, keep making money. And exploration is Put your money into new ventures. You know, try new things out. You know, be creative. You know, take take risks. And um, I was working. I was walking away from this work, thinking, I, I think these are two fundamentally different mindsets. And we observed that. So we had organizations that were really good at all the experimenting on a strategic level, and they had this fantastic new idea. And, we, and then can't name names, but we're like, this is really successful in your pilot market with your pilot technology with your core group that's doing this. Why don't you scale this up? And they said, yeah, we've been trying for three years to scale this, but it's really, really hard. And I understand why it was hard, because it was hard for that set of people uh, to do that, because they have been really, really good at the discovery and experimentation. That is why I think also management teams change in startups when they start growing, because it just requires a different skill set. And I think that's important to acknowledge here on the strategy level that we are dealing with a very different kind of task here. And neither group should dominate uh, the strategy process, but I think it's important to make a conscious choice of who runs what kind of um, uh, activity. So all, everything you've ever learned about change management uh, falls into this um, category here. So let's do this again. Let me know how you guys uh, handle the transformation work. And we're gonna have a look at your answers um, in a second. Here are my key um, takeaways. And I'm not going to go through uh, the, the answers that we got here. You can imagine what they were. Pick up any book on change management and you know, people will have picked so, some of those uh, elements and highlighted them as particularly important. What is important, maybe I'll allow me to go back here. One question. We went up again on the, let's spend a minute on this, on the, on the people impact scale here. Discovery was scary because folks didn't know what was happening and maybe there's a issue, maybe not, maybe I'll be out of a job, maybe not. Experimentation, still a lot of uncertainty, but it wasn't scary because it didn't affect a whole lot of people and those that were affected by it loved it. Yeah? So you just put the people together that like doing that and you have the luxury to do so because you can do it with a handful of folks. Then moving up to the transformation, that is now where we reach out uh, to the entire organization 
and everybody with uh, every healthy person hates change. So, uh, I think I hate it. Uh, and uh, so this is where people get uh, sort of the, the, you trigger their natural impulse to preserve what they have instead of risking it for some some unknown uh, future set. Plus, you know, you may actually be changing people's jobs. People may be losing their jobs. So they may actually have very, very good reason not to like it. A good um, picture we, we found here for, you know, driving these transformation efforts was always thinking about the amount of oxygen. That was the term that was used left in the organization. And if you've just if there's a high workload now, maybe now is not the time to uh, to push this forward. Or if there was sort of a similar exercise earlier, then maybe we should wait a little. So, what we have here, so the four key takeaways for me, uh, I talked about this example. If you can't scale, then you know you may as well you know save yourself the trouble of doing the discovery and the experimentation work. Uh, or you know, saying positively, make sure that you can both innovate and scale and have these skills uh, in the organization. Um, a lot of discussion around the why, the business rationale of doing these transformations, because they are this tr transformation oriented strategy work, because it's never going to be easy. So you better have a really, really good reason for starting it, because people are going to question you a lot on uh, why you're doing this. Then uh, the, the third one, the people aspect, I mentioned that. So I'm trying to co-create the value proposition. So helping them understand actually honestly asking the people how can we make this work for you and what what can your new role be uh, on this and um just let me check the time here because i haven't uh, i'm not going to talk about an awesome example from bmw you can ask me about that later when we're done here about how we can combine top down bottom up uh transformation work in that phase as well as really really intelligent and well thought out communication now Let's see uh, if we got some answers here. Uh -huh. Here we are. All right. I like this. Prepare people and leave space to transform the transformation itself. I think it's a very nice way of putting it. So this is the you know co-creating this with uh, folks. Don't don't make people <clears throat> victims of the transformation or survivors. Between us, I hope nobody from DTU sees this, but I'm also considering myself a survivor of the last uh, transformation that went uh, through the uh, organization here. But creating that space of uh, how, uh, creating degrees of freedom uh, so that people can honestly change things and not just this uh, uh, take it or leave it attitude. Change management, yeah. And uh, I think there are a lot of good books about it. So I think we should all read them again and then try making that. Uh, Happen ambidextrous organization. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. There's exactly this capability of doing what you do really well, but you know, keep changing it um, at the same time. We do incremental improvements and then call them transformations. If you can get away with that, I would do that because I think that's a lot easier than doing the big, uh, big transformation exercises. The question is, you know, there, there, there's a reason why we do it. Although it's hard, because sometimes it, it does seem to be uh, necessary. Uh, positive communication, yeah, uh, good one. I like that. Um, and that is, and what, what does that mean? So again, we can spend a lot of time on that now. But I think being genuine and honest, and you know, earning people's trust uh, or having earned people's trust before you start this, a real, real good impact. <clears throat> okay. And then we have some real questions here. I'm going to skip that because I think these were all really good points. Maybe we have a chance to come back to that later. Now, uh, last but not least, Excel. And the ones of you that uh, pay close attention by now should have noticed the typo that I've built into these slides. Excel should be spelled with one L. I think this is the Microsoft product that we're advertising um, here. So this is now the fourth class of strategy of categories of strategy work that we've seen and um, you could uh, we could easily call that you know we could also call that operations excellence so here is now you know we're making good money we're doing a reasonably good job let's do half a percent a percent two three percent better here on here on here so your standard um, sort of productivity program uh, that uh, everybody experiences uh, uh, once or twice or three times uh, per decade or more, uh, maybe. 
<clears throat> and again, um, I think on, on the one hand, maybe not the most exciting uh, topic of the mix here, but one that is crucially important because uh, I think we, uh, your, your customers will expect that uh, productivity improvement. And if you don't do it, your competition will. And if you don't have competition right now in your market segment, you will have that uh, if, you, if you don't pay attention to that uh, segment here. Now, I'm gonna give you my highlights here. I'm a bit faster here because I, I think a lot has been said about um, productivity improvement initiatives. I'm gonna um, repeat that, but I think the key message here that that is, the fourth category of, of, of strategic initiatives that we've seen and that for your organization, at least you need to ask the question, even if you're making a ton of money now, uh, is that important for us? Because we've seen a lot of very, very important, uh, very, very successful companies growing like crazy that have a lot of trouble because they haven't been doing this, not because they're losing money, but because they're struggling to deal with the complexity of their operations because they've just not been very good at housekeeping and making sure that we're actually productive at what uh, we do. So tell us, uh, tell me a little bit about how you handle um, operations excellence. What uh, What's your uh, approach to that from a, a strategic um, a point of view and uh, key takeaways here i mentioned that it is also strategy work you know it is not it's not something that you leave to uh, to operations yes that's where it's going to be executed but emphasizing it or not emphasizing it uh, that's um, that's also important on the strategy um, level okay let's see if you what you have to say about this one mm -hmm. Find that. Okay, we have a long list here. I'm scrolling down. Yeah, not too much on this. I, I understand that. Uh, the but I think we're all on the same page here. Uh, what uh, about the importance of uh, operations excellence in the context of uh, wider strategy initiatives? Now, <clears throat> if you. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked about mostly what happens inside of these four categories or how we can use that as a categorization for our activities. A really, really fascinating question is how do we move through that space? I mentioned one that is going from discovery to experimentation by asking ourselves, you know, do we have a story, not a business case, but a business story to have somebody who's excited about this? And uh, do we um, do we have enough resources to fund this? And if we lose all of those resources, can we walk away from it? and, and still be healthy. Now you can ask that question for all these steps. When do we start a large scale transformation? When do we maybe stick as uh, one of you has already pointed out in the operations excellence side of things and rely on the incremental improvements? Because that is not per se a bad choice, but it's a question of how, what are our rules for deciding when we're gonna move from one to the other? What I've uh, drawn here, the reverse N, that is I think the uh, what I would call the textbook way of moving through these four quadrants, what makes logically the most sense. But just because it makes logically the most sense doesn't mean that that is the way that we're gonna do it in practice. And of course, we've seen that. And you, we all have stories about transformations that were started where halfway through we realized, oh, okay, we actually need to do a bit more discovery around here because we have literally no idea how to do this. And then you start the experimenting and then you start scaling it up. And that's not bad if you've planned it that way and if you have rules or at least rules of how you want to discuss uh, how you want to move uh, through the space. The same way I've done a lot of operations excellence type work uh, in the past. It's also a great way of, of helping discovery. And uh, that is where, where a lot of good ideas come from that then maybe need to be uh, fed up and uh, uh, put into the experimentation um, cycle. And again, I believe, um, and also what we've seen in our study, that is at least strategy work, thinking about how we wanna make sure that these four categories of activities, we do them all well, and that they also all connect uh, to one another. Now, as a wrap up, a few pointers to additional resources. So we produced a little booklet called the DTU Strategy Implementer. That is basically a walkthrough to what I've just said um, with all the workshop material you will need for thinking this through in your organization and uh, uh, for the first time. You can click on that link after you've downloaded the slides, they'll be available uh, for that download um, to you. And uh, you'll see something that looks like 
this, sort of the three steps uh, that we suggest you go through and you will see the, uh, the two by two again and then a handful of instructions of what you can discuss in sort of a series of three workshops to understand where what your strategy portfolio looks like because that's been we've done that a couple of times and it's actually really interesting also for the executives that we've done this with to see do we have uh, white spots here because usually we end up with a cluster of activities in one corner and then you can ask the question is that where we want to be and the answer may be yes but the answer may also be no let's uh, stretch this out a little bit more so really good way of taking another and maybe new look at the landscape of strategy initiatives um, that you're running. Then uh, we have a little article with the World Economic Forum. So if you uh, want to share what we've talked about today, uh, that's a nice write-up um, here. Basically asking that question, how do we, uh, that came up of the work that we've done that there's a lot happening in the digital transformation and the, the executives find themselves in a situation where having 50 years of experience in a business may actually be a liability and not an asset so how can we still run uh, a meaningful strategy process here and i think what we just talked about is a good answer making sure that we have a good split of activities then there's also uh, a lot of good resources on the brightline website so if you haven't checked that out yet please do i think it's actually um, a lot of good fun content on there. Now, one of them is a book that we wrote together with I think it's 50 called the Chief Strategy Officers Playbook and there's also a little chapter in there uh, about the material that we've just talked about. If you want to get an idea about some of the other things that we've done in the strategy space um, we have a series of articles with the London School of Economics uh, on their website the links there at the bottom I think they're five or six uh, now. Uh, the latest work that we're doing is looking at how to deal with surprises. So basically all the things that happen during strategy planning and execution that we did not think would happen and how we can uh, better deal with it. And it's really, really interesting and a first sneak peek of some of the findings there. All right, and then, oh, thank you very much. And uh, we're now, we already took a few sort of questions, comments, but we have another 10, 20 minutes here to uh, take a few more questions. I'm just opening the window here. So if you have questions, now's the time to put them also in the question window, then now officially questions, not answers. <clears throat> so, I'm, I'm already seeing a few uh, questions here and uh, let me give me a, okay. Let me scroll down. So we are having a really good question here and I wish we could make this a bit interactive to get uh, your input as well. but. Uh, <clears throat> what is the best way to get executives buy-in into a sort of a, a strategy or strategy process in a state-owned entity, so a highly politicized organization? And uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of us are thinking, you think you work in a highly politicized organization, come and have a look at my organization. But I think the, the key here is, and I think that's also what we're trying to make a contribution with, uh, with this work, is it is really important that on the strategic level, there are rules of how we want to discuss what we're working on. And uh, a rule can be that everybody gets to choose a pet project or that a certain person gets to choose a pet project. But we, we saw actually a very nice example uh, for that, how an organization <clears throat> that was working in a fairly complex environment with big personalities on the board, like probably for the most of us, uh, started adopting a quantitative evaluation of uh, their strategy portfolio and was actually able to plug in strat or strategic initiatives and take out strategic initiatives and calculate sort of an overall expected return on investment. I admit that that required a bit of sophisticated math and also business planning, but that I think was one example how they depoliticized uh, a lot of their discussions or at least said, look, here is the financial answer to what the best set of strategic initiatives should look like, or you know, here's three or four to choose from. 
we are happy to add your pet project back in here, but then you know this is what happens. Not sure if that answers all of the question, but that's what I can do uh, there for now. So do we, let me see. How do we cater to the different business process requirements during various stages of the business? So I'm gonna, the way I'm understanding that is that we're doing all of this in a fairly complex stakeholder landscape in our organization that it's not, we can't, uh, can't necessarily decide whatever we want uh, to decide and we don't necessarily know what the, what the best choices are. And I think the, the good examples that we've seen are the ones that found a meaningful way of integrating the expertise of the various business functions into the analysis discovery, experimentation, transformation, and business excellence process, but in a way that A, sort of respected the expertise, uh, and B, uh, will also create the opportunities for them to shape um, the outcome. And uh, I think th the second point is various stages of business. So um, if there's various stages of growth, I think that's a really good question. We haven't studied companies that have been uh, for five or 10 years and looked at how they do it, but we've seen companies at very, very different stages of maturity and growth. And what we felt is that fundamentally the, the categories of activities stay the same. So they all needed to worry about all four uh, quadrants, but then how, um, how exactly they did it or what, um, so let's say level of complexity and number of stakeholders are that were involved in that, that of course changed. Okay, so we just got a new one. So here we get a question about regulatory aspects. <clears throat> and how can we make sure that we um, account for those? So the question is uh, regarding the transformation process, uh, but I think it's it's really, really important in, um, in all, all four of them. In the operations excellence, it's usually clear what we do with the regulatory requirements and regulatory input is, is one of the drivers that have been a regulated business, let's say the, the pharmaceutical industry or so that will drive some of your operations excellence activities. We've seen really with really good and really bad examples of that during the discovery and experimentation phase. I think it's, it's just important to mm, treat that, we could argue also as a, uh, as a set of requirements so that we are a clear what is it that we know about our uh, regulatory environment and sometimes we may complain about it but it's actually a bit of a luxury if that is very very well defined because then we can work with it it gets even trickier when also the regulatory environment is in flux we have projects with companies that try to get autonomous vehicles on the road and you know good luck getting a very clear guidance from your regulatory authority of how we're going to do the safety assessment of those because we don't know yet and then it becomes a co-creation process with the uh, with the regulatory authority and i think there we um the, the good examples that we've seen is where they're actually part of the experimenting and also part then of the transformation process and they just they also need to accept their responsibility in influencing and shaping that Okay, um, I think uh, we had a really good session. I think we went through uh, most of the questions here. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I had a good time, I hope uh, you did too. So we're gonna have um, uh, more events like this in the Brightline Strategy at Work uh, series. If you liked it, um, come back. There'll be uh, more speakers and uh, more topics uh, that we will cover. So it would be great to have you back for one of those events. Uh, until then, you can download the, um, the presentation from today. Uh, you'll have all the links to the material that I referenced for. It's all available free of charge, and you're welcome to share that with uh, your friends and family as well. So thank you very much for today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from you if there's any comments that you have. And then until next time, thank you.